So I'm going to play a little bit more of the academic side and try to talk about some of the foundations of T-shaped expertise. In particular, add this notion of trading zones. And I have to say that I'm sort of beyond T-shaped. I'm a social psychologist. I should put up my info on here. I'm, uh, you can see my background uh, includes being president of a little tiny society that I tried to foster because I'm the only social psychologist of science and technology that I know of. And I live and work in an engineering school, and I just love it because I'm right there with the practitioners all the time. So in a sense, if you looked at the long T of my expertise, it's something I invented myself along the way. It's a very unusual thing uh, to do. Kind of fun, but my kids hate it because they can't explain what I do in two or three words. They say, Dad, can't you come up with something shorter? So I said, well, absent-minded professor will do for that. You know, everybody understands that. Okay. So what is this notion of a trading zone? And in essence, it's extremely simple. It's a human activity that occurs all the time. But I'm adapting it here to the situations we're talking about. Trading zones allow exchanges across cultures that have different mental models, values, and languages. Now, some trades don't involve that. A trading zone involves this kind of exchange across very large differences, the kind of differences in language that Jim was talking about. You have experts, they need to work together, they can't even understand one another, and it isn't because they don't speak English, both speak English or French. The technical terms, the mental models, make it almost impossible. If you start out expecting a complete understanding, not going to be effective. If you start out doing trades and exchanges of a simpler sort, you can gradually build mutual understanding. And the exchanges can be things like time, resources, the knowledge that you can translate. So this is a good framework for starting out and building the much, much more complex situations. And in effect, you're building a kind of T-shaped expertise together. You're teaching each other in a trading zone enough so you become T-shaped ex experts and can work together. So uh, let me give you a very, a very simple example today. One of the things I'm interested in is nanotechnology and convergent uh, technologies, the idea that you're going to have nano, bio, info, and cognitive converge. Um, and so you're going to need at least in there dozens of kinds of expertise, which I've caricatured by saying you're going to need some nanoscientists, you're going to need some folks from IT, you're going to need some folks with systems knowledge, and you're going to need some people with our kind of backgrounds like ethics. You need some ethicists in the trading zone. You need some social scientists in the trading zone. Now the point of this is the difference between these disciplines and cultures is very large. Someone mentioned Kuhn before, uh, maybe you did, Jim. The idea of a paradigm, these differences are so great that the paradigms are almost what Kuhn called incommensurable. They really seem at first blush to simply be unable to talk to one another. The views are so different between, say, an ethicist and a nanoscientist. The ethicist wants to apply his or her expertise to nanoscience, but it doesn't quite fit what's actually going on. They've got to enter into a gradual trading zone dialogue that can blossom into a full-fledged collaboration. And the outcome of this, which it says at the bottom of the slide, if it works, is a reduced common language or Creole. Now, the name there is Peter Gallison. He did the original work on trading zones. He found them as a historian of science. We looked at, say, the development of radar. Radar had to be developed. It had to be developed quickly. It was an urgent, common goal. Great Britain was basically out of business unless you got radar. And you had to get all sorts of people into the same room working fast together. People in the military who thought completely differently than laboratory scientists who thought differently from other kinds of practitioners who thought differently from the engineers. And Galson, who studied this, noticed they had to rapidly evolve enough of a common language, or Creole, to begin to succeed. And that, in some ways, began to lead to new disciplines. But you see these hybrid disciplines all the time. Where do you think biomedical engineering came from? It came from a trading zone at some point. Biologists, people from the medical school, engineers beginning to work together. And those are three very different kinds of communities. Believe me, they're initially they're incommensurable in many, many respects. And gradually, out of a trading zone can come a new discipline, a new field of expertise.
So T-shaped experts can be very, very important in this trading zone. I think we all agree and see the value of T-shaped expertise in multiple areas. One of the areas it's valuable in when we talk about teams and team formation is in helping with these trading zones because the T-shaped expert can facilitate conversations by understanding enough of the other languages and cultures. And here again, behind the language is a mutual understanding of the mental model, but you also need to refine the language together. So the T-shaped expert can function almost in the role of a kind of a trade agent in these trading zones, being able to um, explain and facilitate conversations from very, very different fields. That's another value of it. And also, I think once you do some T-shaped work, you begin to get much more facile. You get some of the anthropologist knack of quickly entering into another culture and asking the right questions and figuring out what's going on. Now, to refine the notion of T-shaped a little bit without using its beautiful ambiguity, there's a certain beauty to ambiguity, remember, because we're moving into a new space together. Um, the closest concept to that in one of the literatures I work in uh, as a psychologist of science, the literature on science, technology, and society, is the work of Harry Collins, the gentleman there in the corner, who independently came up with this notion of interactional expertise. Uh, he was trying to come up with a taxonomy of types of expertise, particularly in social situations. And as you see in the diagram over uh, Harry's head, I put interactional uh, as the top bar and what he calls contributory or core expertise as the long end of the T. So what he did was he is a sociologist of science and he studied gravitational wave physics. His goal wasn't to help the graduate, graduate uh, say that three times quickly, gravitational wave physicists do their work better, he just wanted to find out what they did. But he found as he immersed himself in the community and talked with them all the time and asked them provocative questions, he became facile in their language. He didn't need to develop a creole, he actually mastered the language of gravitational wave physics. Even though he could not do the experiments, even though he could not do the mathematics, he could sit in a room full of gravitational wave physicists and have a very intelligent conversation about what's on the cutting edge of the field, where are the primary needs, even which labs are good and not so good based on results and what the community thought. So we could function as if he were a member of the community. And he wasn't pretending. I mean, he was, they knew he was a sociologist. And they still, and out of that, then you begin to be able to add some value. Your questions actually begin to add some value. Your insights begin to add some value. And I've put in the center of our uh, imaginary neuroscience, IT, and ethics trading zone with multiple other fields, the idea that a service scientist is particularly good at, at playing this role, because I'm very sympathetic to and work in service science. The ability to co-evolve um, solutions may involve being able to work with multiple communities and facilitate their exchanges. And here's an example of one of my friends and colleagues, Eric Fisher at Arizona State University, had the idea of seeing what would happen it was kind of open-ended experiment if he dropped some social scientists and humanists into scientific labs. And here there wasn't any particular common goal. With the trading zone, you ordinarily have some kind of a common goal you're trying to reach, and you spend some time refining that goal together as you work together. Right? But in this case, he just dropped them in to see what would happen. And here we see one of my favorite ones, student Shannon Conley, in her uh, hat, and obviously not a member of the lab, in one slide, and then there she is, smiling as a member of the lab in the next slide. And this transition actually occurred. The lab members first saw her as a kind of an interesting, but like, what are you doing here, outsider? And then as she spent time with them, worked with them, and mastered their discourse, they began to see her more and more as a member of the lab. Again, she could not do the research with one exception. They put her to an engagement ritual, which I thought was great. They said, look, we do, one of our core techniques is doing a PCP. You need to learn how to do that. And she did so, so brilliantly that she got immediate street cred. So you went where, beyond where Harry Collins went, was able to do one of the techniques to participate in that manual activity and uh, gain some of the tacit knowledge and explicit procedures of the lab. But she was able to integrate, and it helped the lab think more broadly about what it's doing. She didn't change their research focus, but you got them thinking a lot more broadly about the ethical issues involved. This was a, a human genetics laboratory that had some medical applications about where they could go with that, about how better to communicate outside of the lab the value of what they were doing. So we have uh, 
the question of education has come up. Uh, Phil mentioned how important it is. And uh, here's just some little provocative uh, tips that I have. So create multidisciplinary collaborations where students have to confront different values. This is the training zone part of it. Not every collaboration requires that kind of deep, uh, different value situation. But students have to confront different values, perspectives, and mental models, all right? So where initially they don't even understand one another and they wonder why, the engineer says, why would anybody be an English major? And the English major says, why would anybody do the engineering? And engineers are so narrow. You get them into these situations where they have a compelling or interesting reason to work together, preferably in a deep dive situation where they're spending a lot of time together. Not just, it's hard to do this when they're running from class to class, right? Because then you immediately have to go to your next class with some kind of urgent common problem or opportunity. It could be working with a business partner. It would be excellent. You know, the business proper partner has an interesting problem here. These bright students, pull them together, have a common goal, get them to work together. And then you need to mentor, easy to say, but hard to do, throughout the process, understanding where it is that they have to get in terms of T-shaped expertise. And here I think we need a lot more scaffolding and a more rigor. And concepts like trading zones need to be explored more thoroughly so we know more about how to teach students how to do it, more about how to apply them, and that application will improve the theory. So here's, uh, you have to have, when you're from the university, a slide of some happy students. We do have some that are happy in their classes. <laughs> um, I teach a course on uh, Earth Systems Engineering Management, which no one exactly knows how to do. It's a framework developed by my friend and colleague, Brad Allenby, who was at AT&T. And it really is an effort to get students to do what Jim was talking about, to think about systems, particularly tightly coupled uh, systems, and how you can begin to manage those. Now, I can't make students into systems managers in eight days in a deep dive, but I can get them to work together across at least the engineering disciplines to see how all those components are necessary to the uh, management of these systems on multiple scales and get them involved in projects. There are particular projects right now you have to do stakeholders vicariously, unfortunately, in mind. We don't have the stakeholders there, and that's why I like Jim's industry collaboration. We get more of those. We actually get some stakeholders, some clients in the room with the students. Um, but in this case, I have them work on a national park system. They take a national park, but look at the whole park. Look at how it fits in the governance system. Look at how it's managed social psychologically. Look at what its restoration goals are and figure out uh, what the park ought to be and how it could get there. Unfortunately, the people in national parks will talk just endlessly to students, at least over the phones. So they have a little vicarious engagement sure. with experts, a uh, little experience of doing the common, uh, common goal, and it gets them to deploy their expertise in areas they hadn't thought about. Um, makes them a bit more T-shaped. Um, I would like to do even more of that, and certainly get them to experience the flavor of a trading zone. What I want is I want students that are not engineers in here. This is one of the problems with the curriculum. I get a few, but only two or three usually in there who are not engineers at all. I would like to have a much more divergent uh, trading zone involved and have real clients on hand to do that with. But it at least gives us an approximation, gives me proof of concept that this can be really exciting for the students. They actually love this. Um, because they're out of the normal classroom context and I'm throwing problems at them that no one knows how to solve and saying, but you can make progress on this. And that very boldness, they're too young to know any better. I love that about students. So you get any scholars and say, you can't possibly do that. And the students say, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe I could do something like that. Good, you know. Certainly won't if you don't try. And uh, this is not actually an advertisement from a book that's gonna make me famous and rich, but I did do a book with uh, the experts on trading zones, interactional expertise. It was a workshop held at uh, Arizona State University, and I drew uh, pretty good chapters from business, from ethics, from engineering, from environmental science, uh, from the perspective of theory that at least gives you an initial sketch out of uh, the role of trading zones and interactional uh, expertise. But these are concepts that application will improve greatly. It isn't just a lab research project. So I look forward to working with anybody in this room who's interested in moving those things forward. Thank you.